Good morning, everyone. We're going to talk about uh, immunotherapies. And Joe and I, we were at a meeting about three weeks ago. And uh, it was a, a combined heme malignancies meeting like this one. And I gave a similar talk. And one of the leukemia docs got up after me and said, you myeloma guys, you all like to brag. <laughs> so I'm going to brag about what we have in the pipeline for immunotherapy for the next few minutes. Um, and I'll, I'll focus your attention on this slide. And really on the far left, the two, the two drugs that are in black, elituzumab and dertumab, those are the only two immunotherapies. Granted, IMIDs are probably immunotherapies also, but those are the only two official immunotherapies that we currently have available in myeloma. But everything else <clears throat> on this slide is currently in clinical trial, um, and this is really just a limited view of it. And this type of talk, the immunotherapy talk for myeloma, is really going to be um, a highlight going forward of every, every presentation that we have um, for the next five to ten years. So we're going to talk a little bit about antibody drug conjugates. We're going to talk a little bit about um, some novel antibodies. And then I'm going to focus more attention on cellular therapies, which is really garnered a lot of interest, in, especially in the last few years. Um, so I'm going to start with the next generation antibodies. And, and one way that we can potentially enhance the function of a, of a naked antibody is by attaching a poison to it, right? So here in this, in this schema, this is, a, this is a pointer, right, Joe? Do I have a pointer? Okay. So I'm going to focus your attention on the left. So you have the antibody binding to the surface of the plasma cell. The antibody with the red circles on it, the poison, gets taken into the cell uh, by endocytosis inside that um, thacule. The poison gets released and then releases its toxin and intracellularly. And these have been quite effective, as we know. Brintuximab is, works quite well for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and, we, and other disorders have it, too. Breast cancer has a, an, an ADC that works quite well. Well, in myeloma, we actually just had our first um, real effective ADC that we've heard in the last few years. And this is the molecule on the right of the slide, and that's GSK2857916, in which we're, we're calling 916. And so in the 916 molecule, you have a cytotoxic agent. It's actually MMAF, an Oristorin derivative. Um, we have a linker, um, and it's an antibody that binds to BCMA. And it can have multiple, to uh, multiple mechanisms of action. It can bind to the cell surface and in, in basically induce cell death by the toxin. It can also induce ADCC. And by blocking BCMA, you probably do shut down some internal signal, some health signal from BCMA, the BCMA pathway. So there's multiple mechanisms of action. So I'm going to show you data in a second from uh, the DREAM1 study, which was initially a phase one. This is part of the phase two, part two in relapse refractory myeloma. Um, and this was actually just recently updated in, in Blood Cancer Journal in March, March uh, last month, looking at 35 patients that were treated at the dose that is um, what we believe is going to be the dose that's going to move forward, but did go forward into a larger phase two study. In this population of 35 patients, the median prior lines of therapy was five. Forty percent of them had received prior daratumab. Um, and the median follow-up at this point in time is just over a year. Um, and so we've seen some of this data on the left showing that the overall response rate in the 35 patients, and this was with single, single agent ADC. There wasn't even a steroid associated with the infusion of this antibody. So this is single, truly single agent activity. You have an overall response rate of 60%. There's very few of our approved drugs right now in myeloma that gives us a single agent activity of 60%. And if you see the waterfall plot, most of these responses were fairly deep. And in, in fact, most of the patients uh, achieved either a VGPR or a CR. So in the updated results on the far right, the overall response rate stays the same, but more people achieve stringent CR, so two, three CRs, and 14 VGPRs. And in, in what we talked about before, the median progression-free survival was about eight months, but now in an update, when they are, the patients are followed for a longer period of time, the, the median progression-free survival is actually 12 months. That's actually quite, that's quite good, in fact. And those people that, that respond, the duration of response is about 14 months. 
And if we look at our, our group of patients that are really refractory to everything, um, refractory to DER2, MAB, or PI, or IMID, the medium PFS is 6.2 months. That's actually quite, quite amazing, in fact. A lot of the pomalidomide data in relapse refractory myeloma had a PFS of less than, less than five months. So this is actually quite, quite active as a single agent. So we also have, we're just getting some, start to see some data on the next generation antibodies or, you know, our dual targeted antibodies. In the dual targeted antibodies, typically you have one arm that, that anchors itself to the myeloma cell and you have the second arm that actually will hopefully engage an immune cell and potentially activate that immune cell in the local environment and hopefully cause a really active anti-myeloma effect. Now what I show here, there, these are, there's many different structures to these dual targeted antibodies. The traditional one is a bite that's from Amgen and we know blinitumab works quite well in ALL. But again, we're just seeing data, and I'll show you some data in myeloma, but I show you a picture uh, in the center of the slide of a, a compound that's being uh, produced at, at Tineo Bio, a pharm pharmaceutical company in South San Francisco. And these, their structure is very different, but on this one, we have a bivalent high affinity anti-BCMA binder. So we, we have two binders on one arm, and on the other arm, we have a low affinity binder to CD3. And those are very different. Some have low, some have intermediate, and some have high affinity, and meaning they have low activation of T cells, they have intermediate activation of T cells, or high activation of T cells. And the reason I say this is because all of these therapeutics, and there's probably about 10 of them now that are in clinical trial, may have different toxicity, whereas if you have a low binder, you might have less CRS. If you have a high affinity binder to CD3, you might have more CRS. So you might have more toxicity for some of, the, some of these that bind different to CD3, and you might have a better binding to BCMA, et cetera, to give you better efficacy. So these things are gonna be really fun to watch. Um, I'm gonna show you now data from, uh, that was just presented at ASH from the first bite, um, and this is for using um, AMG420, Amgen's bite. This is a phase one study, it was a dose escalation study. Um, in this one, because it doesn't have an FC tail, it doesn't have an antibody, typical antibody structure, has to be given by continuous infusion. So it's continuous infusion for four weeks, followed by a two-week break, and then followed by re-initiation um, uh, of, the, of the therapeutic. Um, they started at one patient cohorts, and then they went on to a 3 plus 3 design, the typical design for these early phase studies. And again, this is a relapse refractory myeloma. They had to have prior PI and prior IMID. The standard things, no allogeneic transplant, no CNS disease. And it was basically a safety study to look at uh, the maximum tolerated dose. So what they presented at ASH this year was 42 patients. The median age is 63, about 13% of them had high risk cytogenetics. And they had four prior lines of therapy. And again, about, about a quarter of them had prior daratumumab. In terms of, of safety, they found a DLT at 800 micrograms per day, per day. That was the DLT, and the two major side effects they saw at that point in time was CRS. It did work, it was activating the immune system, but they also saw peripheral neuropathy, which was interesting. And overall, it, in all the patients receiving this, there was about 40% of the patient had CRS. Most of it was low, uh, low grade, grade one and two CRS. They also saw some infections. They saw um, an adenovirus in infection, that resulted in death as well as one um, incidence of aspergillus. They did call them non-related, but the, you know, I don't know if these are related to drug or just myeloma, but it, it, we'll have to see how this, these data emerge. Um, looking at the bottom at responses, if the patients treated at the 400 micrograms per day, which again, was, that was the dose to move forward with. That was the maximum tolerated dose. So they, had, they treated seven patients at that dose, which they were, they, um, reported at ASH, they had five out of the seven patients respond. Pretty amazing. And of the five responders, four out of the five actually achieved an MRD negative uh, state. We're gonna talk about MRD late, later in the morning. But these responses are rapid, rapid and deep uh, responses. And what they said that these, the four, these four early responders actually had durable responses. It was almost, the follow up was almost a year when they presented at ASH and most of those patients were still in remission. Now this is an off the shelf product in relapse and fractory myeloma with the ability to deduce an MRD negative state. This is unbelievable data. And this is just the beginning, right? This is just the first report that we have of these 
dual targeted antibodies. And again, there's 10 or more of those in clinical trial at the current time. So the next, the next year, two years, three years, it's going to be really fun to find out what is better. Is, are these dual targeted antibodies, because it's off the shelf, which everybody pretty much in the room can give, are they better than a car, which a car can't be given by everybody in the room. You need a transplant center, you need a place that's fact accredited, et cetera. So the, these, I think, are really um, going to be fun to watch. Now I'm going I'm to um, talk about cellular therapies um, for the next f five or so minutes. And I'll just say a couple things. There's many cellular therapies that are being tested out there. We do still have some, some cellular therapies where we're taking out the T cells and we're just exchanging the TCR. We're just exchanging the T cell receptor and we're try trying to target that receptor to an antigen that may be on the myeloma cell surface. So one of them that's been used is NYESO1, which is present in about maybe about 20 to 40% to of patients with myeloma. And we currently have a really interesting study going on with Penn, UCSF Penn and MD Anderson, where we're um, basically taking out T cells, we're engineering them with a TCR against NYESO1, and there's also a cassette that's uh, basically allowing us to CRISPR um, delete PD1 in those T cells, and we're also deleting the native TCR. And so perhaps if we delete out PD-1 on the T cells, then the T cells will be less likely to become exhausted after they're infused into patients. So the first patient has just been treated at um, Penn, and we're really interested to look at this te technology and to see if this really changes how long these T cells last, and, and maybe we can get a, a really nice and a prolonged response in this, in this uh, population. We'll just have to see. The other thing I'll note is that there's many studies going on with vaccines. And one of the ones, one of the studies that we've, we did in the U.S. through the CTN was BMT-CTN-1401. It was based on David Avigan's technology, where he takes a myeloma cell, infuses it to, to a dendritic cell, and then uses that as a vaccine. So this, this study um, was recently uh, completed accrual in the U.S., like 16 centers across the country, all the centers were able to make their own vaccines, which is really unbelievable. It was really a great story for um, transplant centers across the U.S. that we could actually do this as a group. Um, so patients with newly diagnosed myeloma came to the transplant center. We harvested their myeloma cells. They got induction therapy. They got a single autologous transplant. And then now, post-transplant, they're being randomized to three arms. One arm is just standard lenalidomide, what we do all the time. The second arm is lenalidomide plus GMCSF um, to see if we can induce a better immune response with, with lenalidomide. And the third arm is the vaccine, which is their own myeloma cells fused to their own dendritic cells, irradiated, and then given back with lenalidomide and GMCSF. So this will be a really interesting study. Preclinical pre data and, and data that led to this study showed that, potential, that this really does augment T cell responses post-transplant. And so now we'll see if, uh, if we really can show that there are more complete remissions and potentially more deep remissions in this strategy. So this is great. And this, this hopefully will have data. Uh, patients are really just getting to the point now where they're starting to get vaccin vaccinations. So we hope to have data in this maybe, maybe in a year, year or so. Okay. Now what about CARs? Is CAR T cells, is it a game changer in myeloma? Well, the, on the far right, J, uh, Jim Kokenderfer showed this uh, a few years ago, and we all said, oh my gosh, you have a multiply refractory pa patient with myeloma, and you can give them T cells, and you can show that their myeloma goes away. And we are all very excited about this data, and we still are very excited, and I'm gonna show you the data in a second. I don't I'm not gonna go over what a CAR is. I think everybody here now knows and has heard about CARs enough. We basically takes the T cell and we're using gene therapy to put a different cell surface um, receptor on the T cell and we have a dual uh, signal internally in the T cell so that we can really augment the responses of T cells. And so um, if, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov right now, there's really, and this is only a few months old, this slide, and it's already outdated. There's over 50 studies looking at CARs in myeloma. It's actually 20 or more are from China. And in the U.S., we have a lot of activity, right? We have Juno, we have Celgene, we have Bluebird, we have, we have uh, Janssen, who now purchased the Legend uh, LCAR from China. We have Kite that's involved in myeloma studies. And then at the end, I hope if we have time, I can show a little bit, little data on, on Poseida. How am I doing on time, Jumbo? I'm okay? Okay, I'm getting there. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so we had three early trials. And I'll just focus your attention on the bottom of the slide. Um, the, on the left is James Kokender first data from the NIH, and the middle is from um, UPenn. Adam Cohen presented these data. And on the right, um, Frank Fan presented it at ASCO. This is a splash from, from the Chinese um, LCAR study. And really what I want to show is that you saw a really high overall response rate when you got to the, to the right dose of, of CAR-Ts. And when we first saw these data, all the data, the PFS was flat. We were like, oh my God, 90 to 100 percent PFS, this is amazing. But then over time, we found out that it isn't just like that, right? People, in, in, in di different than lymphoma, where lymphoma, if you make it past like the first six months, you don't really relapse from your CAR T. Different than lymphoma and myeloma, we are starting to see more and more relapses. And in fact, before we thought, oh my God, is this going to be curative for myeloma like lymphoma? It probably is not. These are data that were just published. This was from um, uh, the LCAR um, from China. And this, this is actually used in this data in China. Actually, the difference in the LCAR, it's actually the, the antibody, the cell surface um, receptor comes from llamas. Um, and it's a heavy chain antibody and actually binds, it binds to um, basically two domains on BCMA. Um, and you know, the one arm set shot on the left is not as good as the two arm set shot, okay? You make many more baskets if you use the two arm. That's what the, that's what the in insinuation is here, okay? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go to the, the slides to show you that here, is, here on the left is the PFS slide. Whereas in, at ASCO, we saw it pretty high in the top. And we only saw a follow-up in the first six to 12 months. And we were like, holy smokes, this is really amazing. But now, over time, we're seeing that more and more patients are relapsing after CAR T-cell ter therapy. And so when you have this much myeloma going in with a CAR T, and you give them a CAR T, you can push it way down, but we are not getting down to zero like they are in, in lymphoma. Um, I'll close with just showing a, a couple slides on basically the, um, the BB2121 which Celgene has now purchased the rights to BB2121. They have now completed a very large phase two study, over 140 patients treated with this. Patients are now in follow-up, and this is likely going to be the, the study that's going to hopefully lead to FDA approval, accelerated approval potentially, for BB2121 or CAR T cells in myeloma. And that's probably expected to see results towards the end of this year, with submission to the FDA, and maybe by mid next year, we will have a product on the market for myeloma like lymphoma. So here's the data. I'll show you this is, I'm going to show you data on um, just over 40 patients, some that were treated in escalation, some that were treated in expansion. And at the bottom, you can see that many of them were treated with our big five guns bortezomib, lenalidomide, carfilzomib, pomalidomide, and daratumumab. Now, what we found out with, with CAR T cells in myeloma is BCMA expression, it's not that high on the cell surface of the myeloma cell. It can be low, though, and you can still get a really amazing response, the right side of this, this slide. Doesn't matter how much BCMA, even there's a little there that T cells can get it. And we also found out you have to give enough, car, you have to give enough CARs. If you don't give greater than 150 million CARs, you're not going to get a great response. You have to give that great response. And with a great response comes CRS. 90% of the patients do get CRS, but <clears throat> we see overall response rates of over 90%, and here's the PFS curve for the BB2121 on the, on the left, uh, where the PFS is about 12 months, but if they achieve MRD negativity, if they really get a deep response, then the PFS is still um, is a little longer, about 18 months. But as you see, p patients are still relapsing, even a year out, even a year and a half out, even two years out people are relapsing. So in myeloma, this is not going to be curative therapy. We have more work to do. And, and with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for your attention.